Mary, don't you weep. Mary, don't you moan. You better find Uncle John and drive him home. Come back, Uncle John. Come back. Welcome again to the Dodcast. I am your host, Luke Dodson. And in case you're wondering what Faustian civilization is, here's a hint. It's the one you're living in, and it's coming to an end. As explained to me by Archdruid and internationally acclaimed author John Michael Greer. So thank you so much for joining me today, John. I've been a a keen follower of your work for a few years now. And um, your work covers such a impressive array of topics that I felt... The term improbable is the one that comes to my mind, but go on. Yes, it's, well, it's, it's, it's improbable and uh, impressive, and it also makes, makes me rather uh, feel spoiled for choice in terms of what it, I actually wanted to, uh, to, to speak mm-hmm. with you about today. But I, I, what I think I'd like to use as a sort of overarching um, mm-hmm. uh, theme, w- which ties a lot of things together, would be something that you covered in The King in Orange. Uh, which is Spengler's ideas and specifically his views Mm -hmm. on Western civilization, which he calls the Faustian civilization. Mm -hmm. So for those who are unfamiliar, could you give a little introduction to uh, Spengler, uh, his ideas of Western civilization and your own Mm -hmm. angle on those? Okay, Um, so Oswald Spengler, um, he was German. He was. He spent most of his career as a high school teacher. He was one of those um, European eccentrics you get so often. Just very intense. Um, th- you know, think shaven head, cold glare, big square chin, that kind of that kind of type. Um, he was interested in history. That you know, he was interested in history the way um, the, the way a bank robber is interested in money. He was deeply into it. And he took the very uh, what, what, the very un- unpopular view, but I think the accurate one, that societies have a life cycle. They they are born, they grow, they mature, they age out, and they die. If we look back through the historical record as Spengler did, you can see this same cycle happening repeatedly, and the same. Um, there, there are certain marking points, certain events that happen reliably um, along the course of history, whether we're talking um, recent history, history of recent civilizations, whether we're talking history of ancient civilizations. Um, the similarities are, are stunning, and he puts a lot of energy into laying this out in his book, The Decline of the West, because his argument is that we're not exempt from this. Of course, that's horribly unfashionable. Everybody says, "No, no, we're special. We're destiny's darlings. We're going to, we're heading off for the stars or something, some such nonsense." But in fact, as he points out, um, Western civilization, as he calls it, Faustian civilization, we'll get to that, um, has so far gone in lockstep through all the same processes, all the same transformations as the Egyptians and the classical civilization and Chinese civilization and so on and so on. Um, It's a familiar pattern. We're at a familiar stage in it. What happens now is decline. And he went into quite some detail writing his, the first volume of his book was published in 1918. The second one came out just a few years later. And he was already talking at that point about the situation where you end up with an entrenched financial bureaucracy, more or less running things through the framework of democracy, but being challenged by populist upstarts. If, if this seems familiar, there's a reason for it. This is what happened. It happened in Rome at a certain point in its history. It happened in China, India, so on and so forth. This is the stage we're in. Now, he... In so far, oh, let me stop for a moment. Over and above this basic common pattern, each civilization does have its unique features. Each civilization has a unique way of looking at the world, a unique approach to questions like society, technology, all this kind of stuff. And even though it has the same life cycle, it has its own, its own vision, its own sense of destiny, and, and which projects it pursues. Sorry. <laughs> Hello there. I'll just <laughs> um, tweak that. There um, we go. Much some civilizations um, pursue the kind of technology that produces loud feedback. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> a, Faustian, yeah, some, some, a Faustian blast there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um, 
you know, some civilizations are focused on, on um, duration. They want to last. They want to endure. Egypt is the extreme example here. I mean, think of their burial practices. Their notion is that the, the, human, the human body must be made to last forever by mummification. Um, they built the pyramids and temples that, that have endured better than certainly anything we ever built. Um, our focus, the focus of Faustian civilization, is infinite extension in space. That's why we have this fixation with space travel. We used to have a fixation for um, distance on the Earth. I mean, we're the first society in history where explorer was a job category. Yes. Um, we're also the only civilization in history that made linear perspective the basis of its art. Again, it's these li- straight lines zooming off to infinity. That's our, that's our idiom. That's our, our métier, if you will. And so all of this... Spengler drew together into his vision of, of where we are and where we're headed. And where we're headed is, well, he argued that it's the same place as every other civilization, that we're headed into decline. You can, you can hardly say that these days. People will just lose it. No, no, there's got to be progress, there's got to be growth. That's all in the past. For Western civilization, we finished that. Um, in terms of technological progress, look at the output, look at the output of inventions going to patent offices Invention actually peaked in the 1880s, and we've been running on um, steadily declining rates of innovation ever since. Um, I mean, look at your automobile is running. That's, that's 1890s technology with a few computers thrown in, and the computers are basically refined 1970s, 1980s technology. Um, our airplanes, I mean, the airplane was, was first it was invented in 1906, the jet engine during the Second World War. Most of our technologies are really based on aging principles the computer revolution the thing that everyone fixates on that's the one that's the one really late 20th century invention it's still sort of going through its changes and as inventions do um we're beginning to figure out that it is not everything it was cracked up to be it's coming up for example that a lot of the tasks that the big software companies have were claiming yeah we're doing we're using artificial intelligence for this they're not they're hiring thousands of people in big in big facilities in in places like the philippines and india to do it you know manually human beings filling in the blanks and doing all this stuff so they can go through the pretense that it's artificial intelligence so decline is in our future we're already seeing the signs of it. Um, most most parts of the industrial world um, look at the surroundings. Notice just how you know, how cracked the sidewalks are, how how much de- urban decay there is, how much rural decay there is, how much the effective standard of living has been sliding for years. We're in that state of contraction, as as Spengler predicted. And we're in the political um, conflict between the entrenched managerial class with its control of money and populist upstart leaders who are um, gathering together the people who don't, who can't stand the existing order of things and saying, no, we need to change. That's going to accelerate. Yes, yes. So this is something that makes Spengler such a, um, an outlier in mm-hmm. um, in contemporary um, intellectual culture, and oh, yeah. this this always to me this always makes uh, acts as a sort of uh, a sign of of credibility in my view that the less popular <laughs> uh, <laughs> any given oh, yeah. <laughs> oh I think yeah, yeah. No, that, that's that everybody wants to you know m- not everyone most people want to see history in terms of the ruling myth of the modern world which is progress. I mean, progress is, is our God. Progress is our religion. And I mean that quite literally. People put the same kind of faith in progress now that medieval peasants put in, in, in God. And, you know, people expect progress to save us. They expect progress to bring the wonderful new world of the future. Um, it's, it's total blind faith. And so when Spengler is a heretic, and of course he wasn't the only heretic, we'll get to that, as Spengler is a heretic, says, no, we're not going to the stars. We're not even going to be, you know, <clears throat> we're not even going to extend our power over the rest of the planet. It's a matter of gradual contraction and sinking into um, various kinds of stasis, various kinds of decline, until eventually Western civilization, as it now exists, has gone the way of, of um, you know, Egypt and Rome. And 
people are picking through the ruins of you know of, of ancient industrial societies. Well, well, new civilization rise up, you know on top of the rubble. It's a familiar thing. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that Spengler was not the only person saying this. Arnold Toynbee, um, mm-hmm. a very important British historian and a very controversial one, um, filled twelve hefty volumes. The title was A Study of History. I mean, the guy he could have used. Um, help with titles, but 12 hefty volumes with evidence of historical cycles. Um, back in the very early um, 18th century, right around the time Isaac Newton was, was getting old, um, there was a guy named Gian Battista Vico mm-hmm. in Italy who really did the first sketch of this in his book, The New Science, where he showed that bas- basically he was looking at his civilization, he was looking at Greece and Rome, because that's the data that he had to go on in those days, and saying, okay, look at these common patterns. Look at this arc of rise and fall. Look how we've come to here. Oh, guess what? We'll be peaking in a few centuries and then declining in turn. <clears throat> it's not popular if progress is your, is your religion, but popularity does not determine truth. And so far, predictions that have been made on the basis of this kind of cyclical theory, on the basis of Spengler's theories, on the basis of Vico's theories, those predictions have turned out to be true. Where the predictions of onward and upward have flopped. I mean, I, you know, we've all heard the jokes. Okay, so where's my jetpack? Mm. You know, where's my flying car? Where's that electricity too cheap to meter the nuclear power is going to give us? I could go on for a week. There are all these, all these failed promises about about the technology, the wonderful technological future that's waiting for us, and it's the same promises endlessly retailed, and yet people, you know, running after them, convinced that this time it's definitely going to work. Oh, well. So, do you mean to tell us that uh, Elon Musk's prediction of uh, uh, electric cars driving us between uh, uh, terraformed (laughs) colonies on Mars is uh, not indeed uh, on the menu of possible futures? (laughs) (laughs) I, I... I do not know. I do not know if Elon Musk is one of the great con artists of our time, <laughs> or if he's a hopelessly clueless true believer. I really don't. It seems improbable to me that someone that smart could believe such complete nonsense. Um, I mean, the whole thing about Mars... I mean, I, I'm going to show my age here a little bit, but back when I was young, um, the United States and the Soviet Union, which of course still existed in those days, were all gung ho. We were going to have bases on the moon. We were going to have settlements on Mars. Blah de blah de blah. And then the early 1970s came along, and the brakes got slammed on. Nobody wanted to talk about why, but there's a real simple reason: radiation. We've got a, gi- a gigantic nuclear reactor at the center of the solar system. It's called the Sun. It, pu- it pumps out huge amounts of hard radiation, as well as light and heat. Now, here on Earth, we've got a magnetosphere. We've got this powerful magnetic field around the planet that makes that radiation bend and bounce away. That's why we, that's why we live. That's why this planet isn't sterile like Mars. Mars doesn't have a magnetic field like that. The moon doesn't have a magnetic field like that. Deep space, where we're going to put all those space stations doesn't have a protective magnetic field. Um, If you keep the space station low enough, like the International Space Station, it's more or less inside, so it's pretty well safe. But once you go outside, you know, you're you're camping out next to a reactor, basically. And so the thing that everyone has been trying not to talk about, but everyone in space science knows this, is that we're never going to have settlements on Mars, because by the time you get there, you're already going to be getting sick from radiation poisoning. And unless you spend all your time on Mars, well, underground, building from the radiation, blasting down from the sun, you're probably going to be dead by the time you get home. Nobody wants to talk about this because everyone has their brain full of Star Trek or what have you. But that's the reason why everybody dropped their planetary exploration programs in the early 1970s. And... I mean, there's a, there's a certain amount of talk, there's a certain amount of hand-waving, you, we can go back to the moon because we can get there, get back, and um, not get too thoroughly fried, it's only a few days away. But 
it's not going to happen in any other scale. And that that's so unthinkable to most people that somebody like Elon Musk can continue to, to sell shares in, in you know his castle in the sky. Well, it is a very strange thing, isn't it? That I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it, I I've never mu- been much of a believer in po- progress. In fact, I grew up in a family in which um, the the ideas of John Zerzan, you you you, mm-hmm. you are, are familiar with, quite familiar with, yeah, familiar with, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, were 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 discussed quite freely. So you know, mm-hmm. uh, we weren't exactly um, ardent believers in the 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 miraculous power of technology and, uh, and the wonder, wondrous future uh, and so when i when i uh, when i point out to people that really we're probably not going to be living on mars ever let alone within 10 years it some people and some people are yeah are like yeah you're probably right but it does seem to with a you know certain number of friends of mine uh, uh, you know very switched on people you know very intelligent educated people it really kind of no but we will i tell you let me just show you this next video if i just show you this next (laughs) video of the latest rockets that elon musk is making then it will convince you (laughs) it's like sorry guys but no and and that's the thing but it it, it does hit to the the heart of this faustian Mm -hmm. ideal doesn't it yeah the the thing is this this the rocket is the ultimate expression of Faustian consciousness. It's a straight line going to infinity. Mm. Um, it's it's a gigantic space penis, basically ejaculating its way into the heavens. And so it has it. Uh, that obviously gives it a powerful attraction to a certain class of young men. But it is it it, it it's a mythic image. It's a very powerful myth, and people put, as they do with myths, people put an enormous amount of emotion, an enormous amount of hope, an enormous amount of, of passion into these images. So, you know, your friend who wants to show you this video of Elon Musk's latest firework, um, that's a religious icon. You know, that's like, that's like showing you an image of the Virgin Mary or an image of, of, of the Buddha or what have you. That, you know, that's his image of salvation. Because that's the, that's the, that's the idea of, uh, behind all these fantasies about living on Mars is the idea that we're somehow breaking free from the human condition, zooming off to new amazing things. And the fact that living on Mars is not going to be that much different, even if it could happen, it would be not that much different from living in Nevada. Okay, you've got a lot of dirt, you've got a lot of sand, you've got a lot of rock, you've got, um, if the weather is not very good, it's Nevada. Hmm. And so what's so exciting about this? What's going to, what, what's the marvelous transformative, and you see, this is the problem with the Faustian dream. Back in the day, we're, we're talking, you know, 500, 600 years ago, the idea was, you know, you, you're sitting there in an English village and, and, and the idea of going to France, the idea of going to Spain, these were exotic, amazing places. You know, you could transform your life. And as the, as the, the ability to travel developed, as technologies improved, maritime transport, that moved out further and further out until it was going to America, going to Australia, going to the ends of the earth. And so one of the, one of the things that, that the Faustian, our Faustian civilization has desperately tried not to understand all along is that, that famous saying in certain circles, wherever you go, there you are. Mm. <laughs> you cannot transform your life by going to a different place, even if the different place is Mars. Uh, you're probably, you know, you're going to get to Mars and you're going to be pushing a mop or something um, in, in, in a corporate, um, in a corporate space uh, colony where every breath of air you take is controlled by the, um, you know, by the administration. How marvelous. Well, this is, yes. Yeah. You know, in space, in space, no one can hear you protest. <laughs> Well, it was um, there's a, a sort of subtle hint of a satire of that in the um, in the beginning of the film Blade Runner, where you have a a sort of you know it's a very Faustian film, but you have a, a mm-hmm. little one of those flying blimp drone things going around. And it's got mm-hmm. this advert that says, "Start a new life in the off-world colonies," 
and a golden <laughs> chance to begin again. And, and it's like you, you just know we're looking at the street of LA with it just which is just complete you know, crap and environmental decay and it's just raining all the mm-hmm. time, you probably acid rain. Uh, it's going to be exactly like that there, you know, if maybe exactly. even a little bit worse. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but but going to, to something kind of more, um, more subtle about the Faustian mm-hmm. civilization that occurs to me, when you, you, you mentioned that Spengler's view of the Faustian civilization is that basically it's a straight line pointing into infinity. Mm-hmm. And this strikes me that there's something else that th- this this attitude kind of suffuses and, 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 and permeates so much of what we do and in including mm-hmm. not just our technology and our technological dreams of the future, mm-hmm. but also our pursuit of spiritual knowledge. Bingo. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, oh, yes. And, 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 and I'm particularly thinking in the modern age that our use of the psychedelic chemicals and and mm-hmm. also other other things imported techniques from 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 indian traditions such as mm-hmm. kundalini yoga and such like that those the way that we use these and i, I don't know that it, it, they have to be used like that but mm-hmm. it's very much in the keeping with that isn't it Oh, very much so. Very much so. Uh, again, it's the idea is to escape. It's to to break free from the limits of the human condition, whether by um, by taking a pill or by um, you know engaging in this practice that will raise you to higher levels of consciousness. It's again the straight line to infinity, and the mere fact that it doesn't work um, never gets in the way of the image. Um, I mean, I mean, if you look through the history of um, the use of drugs for as an attempt to get spirituality the fast way, it goes back a long ways. Mm. Um, back in the back in the mid nineteenth century, people were taking opium for that. Or people, um, let's see, Anna Kingsford was active in the eighteen eighties. She used to get herself dosed with chloroform to um, you know, to get into these trance states where she saw marvelous visions. <laughs> and, you know, every, every, every generation or so, there's a new drug that's supposedly going to be the wonder drug. I mean, I... I came on right in the in the kind of la- the backwash of, of LSD, and by the time I was an adult, um, ketamine was in use, and yes. I don't even know what they're doing these days. But you know, every few years there's this new drug, and it's always the same thing. It's always this will you know cleanse the doors of perception and and so on and so forth, and it never works, and it ends up with a certain number of psychiatric casualties, and then they go on to the next one. The dream is stuck in place in the same way. Um, yoga, I mean, serious yoga practice will, will is, is certainly worth doing. It can take you to some very interesting places. It can give you some experiences, some understanding of yourself. It's not going to make you a you know, a superhuman you know guru um, or what have you. It's not going to you're not going to transcend the human tradi- the human condition by the practice of yoga. But that's the way it's sold. And that's the way. The reason it's sold that way in the Faustian world is that's what people are looking for. Mm. I have to deal with a lot, this a lot um, as a teacher of Western occultism. Mm. I get people who they want to become. They want to study occultism because they want to become the you know su- the overman. They want to become this you know these the superhuman beings. Every so often, I actually feel letters from. I, I'm pretty sure they come from like 14 year olds and so on, who want to know how they can get superpowers. <laughs> too many Marvel comics or something, but you know that's not what we're talking about, and yet that's what everyone's stuck on. Everyone wants to have that zigzag birthmark on their forehead and to be able to to be to be able to become the marvelous, special, gifted person who who just completely transforms the world, because that's our mythology. That's the that's the Faustian dream, and you'd think it would get old by now, but people are still desperately trying to do it. Hmm. Yeah. What's your view of uh, the other the other uses of of say drugs in spiritual practice in traditional cultures, say like the uh, the Mazatecs mm-hmm. of of Mexico mm-hmm. using the the mushrooms and that sort of thing? What was your take on that? Oh, well, the thing is, traditional cultures have had the have had the time and and patience to figure out how to use those. And um, I, you know, I'm not an initiate of their teachings. 
I'm not, I'm in no position to pass judgment. But if you've got a traditional culture that's been using something like, like you know, one of the hallucinogenic mushrooms or what have you, and they get good results, more power to them. Mm. Um, but that's not what's going on in our culture. People are using that as an excuse to say, oh, I'm going to get really stoned and become something transcendent. <laughs> and it doesn't work. <laughs> Well, this is something... Uh, you know, if, if you want to move to Mexico and live, and, and you know, sh- live like, uh, you know, a peasant in one of these tribes and gain their trust and spend the necessary years learning enough about the culture and the religion and the spiritual practice that then you can do the thing, and that's one thing. Not that it's not you know not that they will necessarily welcome you, but if but you know if you can if that if that works for you that's great. Um, we see this with you know people people going to various parts of the world and if you know when they're welcomed, when they're accepted, when they're given the training, that's excellent. But I want to see it done on the terms that the, that the culture that the the actual culture uses, and not just. Another bunch of clueless white guys horning in there saying, oh, cool, a new way to get stoned. <clears throat> and spiritual. Don't forget spiritual, mm. but stoned, you know. Mm, mm. Yeah. <laughs> Again, this is, the, I, think it was, I think it was actually the mid-18th century, people in, in European countries found out about shamanism. Mm. And, you know, we think of the whole shamanism thing as this is this late 20th century thing, um, and um, Michael Harner and so on. But in fact, there was a big fascination with shamanism in the in the 1750s. Hmm. People were publishing articles on the sh- on these these mysterious people and um, talking about the medicine me- medicine people in among the Native American nations and so on. And that was their exotic, you know, a, you know, foreign spirituality and that they like to talk about. So something, you know, we we have this image in Faustian culture that we're on our way, we're we're doing these completely unique things, we're breaking new ground, we're on our way to something totally new, and at the same time we're doing something that people were doing before the American Revolution. Mm. Mm -hmm. With the the use of these things, and even even, uh, the kind of uh, casual or occasional recreational Mm -hmm. use of, of substances, and we we've corresponded a little bit about this on your via your dream width blog um which mm-hmm. anyone by the way um so john for anyone who doesn't know hosts a uh, a blog two blogs in fact uh, which I'll put links to and one of them is on the um the service dream width and every monday uh, you can ask him anything you like about occultism and uh, and he will give you an answer. So um, do check that out for anyone who hasn't yet. Um, but anyway, <laughs> now, so yes. you'll get it. you'll get an answer. It may not be the answer you want. <laughs> yes, but you'll get an answer. <laughs> exactly, exactly. As is always the way with these things, isn't it? Oh um, yeah, yeah. But 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 we we've spoken a little bit about this, and I wanna I wanna come back to it because I find this mm-hmm. really interesting and something mm-hmm. that just I'm. I'm uh, involved, or well, I have been involved in the uh, kind of site in what's been called the psychedelic renaissance or whatever, <laughs> via some <laughs> friends of mine who who um, have set up, um, you know, various societies and a conference called Breaking Convention. Very dear friends <laughs> of mine who, um, you know, and, and more power to them for doing doing the work in, in, in <laughs> actually trying to um, take these things seriously. But in that scene, I've never seen anyone really uh, discuss the thing that only two people I've seen talk about are yourself and my friend Jason Horsley, uh, mm-hmm. the writer. Um, mm-hmm. And both of you have pointed this out, which is that drugs in general and psychedelics in, a, in specific ways have particular effects on the body that are not always beneficial is that right <clears throat> that's a very gentle way of putting it yes, yes. Uh, um the second you know uh, you're ingesting strange compounds into your body you're changing your biochemistry um there are going to be consequences as there are with any taking any medicine any powerful chemical um yes you can mess yourself up you can mess yourself up physically. You can mess yourself up psychologically. Um, I mean, 
those of us those of us who remember the backwash of the acid days will have met the people who took you know too much acid and were just kind of going around well the unfortune actually has a great the, the english english occultist has a great line um talking about all these people who want to use drugs to loosen the girders of perception <laughs> The problem is they don't have any way to tighten them back up again, so they go through life rattling like a cheap motor car, she says. <laughs> I, I, we've all met the type. Yes. We've all met the potheads who cannot think two coherent sentences one after the other because it's just kind of, wow, man. We've all met the acid heads whose, whose brains are basically fried. Um, you can damage yourself with this stuff. And and that's as true of the psychedelics, of the head drugs, as it is of the body drugs. So you're, you're dealing with powerful things here. Um, it's not just... And, and, you know, this, is, this is actually another one of the major mistakes that's hardwired into the Faustian culture's consciousness, the idea that everything in the world is what you say it is. Mm. This drug is a key to higher consciousness. Therefore, it is a key to higher consciousness and... By God, you will make it behave that way and insist that it's that way, even if it fries your brain cells. <laughs> mm. yeah. As though the word, the world cannot be allowed to get a word in edgewise, as though the drug itself doesn't have anything to say about it. Mm. So, yeah, the mm. thing is, these things can be harmful. They can, they can mess you over. So, for those who are, are you know, dabbling in such things, and many of them I know, and many of them listen to my my mm-hmm. podcast uh, what what would you say if if you really if you really must do these things what would you say the the best ways to keep yourself safe and healthy in the process well i i'm honestly not the person to ask because um that's not a path that i've explored i i mean i did I, I, I did some drugs back in, in my first pack th- pass through college in the 1980s. I did some LSD, I did a, a certain amount of pods, some mushrooms, this kind of stuff. Um, this was in the very early 1980s again, uh, and it was very common. Um, I got bored. I, you know, I had I had my acid trips and said, okay, well, you know, I can get stranger places than that uh, just with, with my own mind. And so I, I really I really think you need to talk to somebody who actually has more experience than I do. Um, my usual advice to people is don't. There are there are better options. But if somebody really wants to do that, find people who've been around, who know how it works, and who know that, who are willing to talk about the downside. That's the crucial thing. Mm-hmm. If somebody says, "No, no, this is wonderful. It is the key to you know," again, you're you, you're talking to a true believer. Don't and, and don't don't believe what they say. But. If you can find somebody who's experienced, who can talk about the pluses and minuses, the upsides and the downsides, and who actually had a lot of experience with this stuff, that's probably your best guidance. Um, beyond that, I'm really not sure what to say because, again, not my path and not something I have enough experience with to be able to offer sensible advice. Mm. Well, that's that's fair enough. Let's take it back to the um, the Faustian the the, the Faustian mm-hmm. theme. And um, uh, what what I found really interesting in uh, one of the many things I found very interesting in your latest book, The King in Orange, um, which is out now. Who's the publisher again? Um, that's with Inner Traditions. Inner Traditions. That's it. Yeah. So so um, th- this was your your latest work, and it's mm-hmm. it's riled up a few people already, which is uh, always a good sign. <laughs> Um, and, and when I was when I was writing the original blog posts that fed into this book, I could count on every time I posted one, there would be a dozen, two dozen, three dozen screaming meltdowns, people <laughs> shrieking abuse of me because how dare you say these things? That's how I knew that I was saying what needed to be said. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, what what the what the what the book is about. Um, as as the, the the name some people might have guessed already is it, it, essentially it's um, magic and politics in Trump's America, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's correct. And so and go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah, you go for it. Okay, so so yeah, the thing is, the Donald Trump phenomenon was an astonishing chance to look at the way that magic pervades. American culture, but it pervades the culture of all the industrial nations, but, mad, but, but America perhaps more clearly, because we're, we're frankly less subtle than most other people. Um, and so watching the way that uh, people polarized around this, this remarkable figure, a, you know, a, a reality TV host running for president 
and winning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and watching the way that, that people lost their minds on both sides and freaked out and engaged in the most the most astound, astoundingly mythological thinking. Here are these supposed inhabitants of an advanced technological society, and their immediate fallback would have made perfect sense to any tribal society. We must use magic. And mm. so we had, we had just this, this immensely mythic context, thus my borrowing the, the verbiage from the king in yellow, um, Robert Chambers' book of um, book of supernatural horror, um, to get that feeling, that sort of Lovecraftian feeling of the world tearing apart and something tentacled rising out, mm. rising out from it. Um, and of course, part of the problem of talking about that is that people, as Carl Jung pointed out a long time ago, people who are caught up in a myth, the one thing they will never allow themselves to see is that they're caught up in a myth. They said, no, no, we're being perfectly calm and reasonable, <laughs> calm and reasonable, and um, the, the, the shrieking tantrums that we are flinging and the, the bizarre accusations we're making and the weird illogic that's governing our minds, that's all perfectly calm and reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> and so just watching the whole thing, it was an amazing chance to see the profoundly mythological, non-rational, irrational, frankly crazed underpinnings of the culture of the United States, of the culture of the industrial world, and, and the basic structure of human thought. Anyway, um, of course, one of the major one of the major challenges here is that I had to talk about the reasons why Trump actually won the election, yeah. which nobody in authority, nobody in the positions of influence in the United States wants to talk about. Mm, mm. Um, you know, it's really simple. It is incredibly simple. When I was young, uh, take 1966, okay, I was, I was four years old then. In 1966, um, one person who had a high school education and a working class job could support a family, could support, could afford a home, a car, three school meals a day, all the necessities of life and maybe you a little left. Okay. One person on school education, one working class job. By twenty sixteen, one person with a high school education and working class job, they were living on the street. The destruction of the working classes in America, their the 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 policies that drove them down into poverty and misery. It's the biggest political fact of our society, and nobody wants to talk about it. The media will not touch it. The pundits will, will, will turn themselves inside out right there on the on the screen rather than even mention that it happened. But it's a huge reality. We all know it. We all live with it. Nobody wants to talk about it because the people who benefit from it are the middle classes, the middle and upper middle classes, the pe- the suburbanites, the people who whose um, costs of living were kept down by driving the working class into into impoverishment and misery. And so they, you know, because they, they one of the things about the American middle class is that it loves to see itself as the good people, mm. the virtuous people, the compassionate people, the people who care. And here they were enthusiastically um, backing policies that drove tens of millions of people into misery and despair. That's the reason why everyone wigged out the moment Donald Trump started saying, um, maybe we should bring jobs back to this country. Maybe we should stop the policies that bring in tens of millions of illegal immigrants to drive down wages and working conditions. Maybe we should um, look at the regulations that are being used to destroy small businesses for the benefit of big corporations when small businesses are the major producer of jobs. The moment he started talking about that, the middle class, the upper middle class, the, the media, all of the, whole, the, the, the entire structure of the American officially accepted reality melted down into screaming frenzies because we don't talk about these things. And they're still at it. They're still shrieking. They're still freaking. And because of the same thing, because... If they actually own up to it, if they actually say, yeah, well, you know, we actually did these policies and um, the, the result was that millions of children go hungry in America today. 
and, and we're good with that. They couldn't live with themselves for five seconds. So instead, you get the weird mythological thinking. You get the, the, the insistence that Trump doesn't have any policies. He's just about eight. <clears throat> he had very specific policies. Now, was he a nasty person? I don't know. I've never met him. Um, did Were some of his policies bad? Uh, no doubt. Um, but the, the shrieking outrage... The famous pictures of the people at the um, at the inaugurating inauguration screaming "No!" <laughs> to the skies. <laughs> if, you know, you you realize these people had had you know they had had their sore consciences poked hard, and since they weren't willing to face up to what they've done, what they had done, what they what the policies they support were doing to people, you know, as again, Carl Jung is relevant here. Projection. If you suddenly realize that you've been behaving in an evil fashion and you cannot stand that awareness, you project it onto someone else as fast as possible. Say, no, 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 that, that evil orange man in the White House, he's the bad one. I'm good. Mm. Mm. So, now, does this mean that Donald Trump was an angel of light? Of course not. Does this mean that his followers were angels of light? No. Um, please, let, let us be real. This is real politics, and politics is grubby. Politics is always about who gets what. It's always about who gets the goodies. And that's, you know, that's true of every political system ever. And so, but the, the contrast that I wanted to explore in this book is the contrast between ordinary politics and this bizarre mythological state that people got into. And, and what that implies, what that shows in terms of the, um, the way the magic functions, what that shows in terms of the deep structure of American society, what that shows in terms of our future. Mm. Um, did it cause people to melt down in screaming tirades? Of course it did. Um, you cannot talk honestly about America today. I, I don't think you can say any honest word about America today without somebody melting down. Hmm. Hmm. Well, the Trump phenomenon crystallized a, a process that I've witnessed over the course of my adult life which is the mm -hmm. uh the the kind of the co-optation of the what used to be the left uh, uh -huh. completely mm -hmm. into a corporate friendly establishment friendly narrative to the mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. where uh trump's po any of trump's policies that back in sort of say 1999 when the Seattle protests were happening against the WTO, and the mm -hmm. you know the anarchists and the Black Bloc were all against oh, yeah. the, the global, I was living. I was living in Seattle when that happened. Right. By the way, so yes, I remember that whole business very well. And yeah, yeah, the policies they were pushing were policies that Trump put into place. Yes. <laughs> and yet, watching the left melt down and and run for sh you know sh we're going to shriek racism. Uh, or what have you? We've got to come up with these things. You're right. It's the the total surrender of the left to the corporate establishment is just it's been bizarre. Mm. Mm. Now I think part of it is that the left in the Western world has predominantly been a, a an affectation of the privileged. Um, I mean, you always you always had working class leftists, but. This, this, uh, in, in, the Fabian socialists in Britain, the New Dealers in the United States, you always had this tendency of the left to be um, a way that the, the managerial classes wanted to extend their power. You know, we can fix that. We'll, we'll put in a bureaucracy and hire a lot more college graduates. <laughs> and... And so you you know in some ways um, the, the the Tony Tony Blair's um, completion of the takeover of labor in in Britain, um, Bill Clinton's equivalent takeover in the of the Democratic Party of the United States, the process by which the parties of the left sold out to the corporate establishment, is the natural the natural unfolding of this tendency toward privileged progressivism. You know, we're going to make everything better, but we're going to put our own privilege first. Yes. Because that's always it. That's always involved. When, again, in, in, um, not, not long ago in Britain, where Keir Starmer was um, saying, you know, no, we're not, we're not going to talk about raising the minimum wage. Mm. Right. <laughs> Why not? 
a lot of people would be a lot of working class people, you know, the people that labor supposedly is there for, they'd be hugely benefited by that. We're not going to talk about that. Why? Because it would get in the way of the profits of, of Starmer's actual constituents, you know, the corporate class. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it's sad. Uh, labor used to stand for something. The Democratic Party used to stand for something. But watching people abandon every form of pro forma dissidence, um, if I may, t- if I may t- touch on an edgy subject right now, around the current coronavirus crisis, the number of people who were, at least on paper, suspicious of corporate medicine, suspicious of the medical and pharmaceutical industries, um, didn't necessarily believe anything that the MD said because they have, um, are certainly over here, our medical industry has a long history of lying itself blue in the face. And all of a sudden, Dissidence is forbidden. All of a sudden, there is only one truth, and it's what comes out of the corporate, the, this corporate, you know, uh, mouthpiece. And these are people. These aren't people on the right who are doing it. It's people on the left. It's the it's the liberals, it's the progressives, it's the socialists, it's the radicals who are demanding that everyone believe what a corporate flag tells them. Weird. Very weird. Very weird. <laughs> Yes, I, I'm glad that you brought this up because I was actually going to move on to that next, which is mm-hmm. okay. the COVID, the COVID situation, and another example of, how, as you say, mm-hmm. um, that the left have fallen into lockstep with policies that are destroying the working class, shoving yeah. them out of jobs. But you know, but mm-hmm. whether through lockdown or through the shutdown of industry or through these. Yeah. Um, you know, insane vaccine mandates, you know, frankly, mm-hmm. for an untested series of, of bizarre we, medical interventions. We, 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 have, we, have a, we have a drug that received eight weeks of testing of a type that every previous example was pulled from, from, from production in long-term tests because it caused serious problems. So we just skip the long-term test, give it eight weeks of testing, and the demand that everyone get injected with this thing. Yes. If you look at the, um, you know, you, those companies, those countries that have a place for vaccine problems to be reported, we have a system here in the United States that's not very good, but this, these vaccines have caused like 50 to 100 times more negative side effects, including death, than all other vaccines put together. And yet... There's no criticism. If you try to criticize, it's just, it's no, you know, um, the cor- our corporate masters have told us what to believe and we believe what, what they tell us. It's bizarre. Very bizarre. And, and as, uh, you know, um, here in the United States, getting up-to-date information on the death rate is not easy. Um, if you look in, in various parts of Britain, the overall death rate is, is rising. Mm. For no reason anybody's willing to talk about it, except there's all these people having unexplained heart attacks. Mm-hmm. Gosh, maybe a medicine that causes clotting might be responsible. No, we can't talk about that either. It's weird. And I, I'm, not, I'm really not sure entirely what to make of it, um, and, and especially what to make of the way that the, the, the supposedly anti-establishment, supposedly anti-corporate, supposedly independent thinking left has just turned into... You know, a bunch of I, I don't, I don't know, I don't have a word for it. Sheep have more, have more of a sense of self-preservation than that. <laughs> yes. Well, there's a, a you know, indicative uh, uh, a little thing that I saw recently on Facebook, mm-hmm. which is um, uh, on Facebook. Basically, you, you have these little banners that you can put on your profile picture to sort of mm-hmm. give a give a, a message that you want to put out like vote labor or whatever it is and mm-hmm. one of uh, one of them that's going around now is i have a healthy distrust of authority and i've been fully vaccinated against covid what D- yeah no <laughs> that's like saying I'm a virgin and I have sex weekly. <laughs> you know, I am a celibate. I, I am a celibate prostitute. I am a vegetarian carnivore. One of these things is not like the other. It's, it's, yeah. And, yeah. 
and the fact that people can say that and not realize that they're trying to set themselves up as vegetarian carnivores. Yes. Um, it's just, it's, it's weird. And, you know, when I, I say weird, I remember that the, you know, the, 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 that word in Old English meant doomed. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yes. Well, it, 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 it it's just betrays a sort of a strange awareness on one level mm-hmm. because if there wasn't something spooky going on here, then no one would feel the need to say, to, no, I do have a healthy distrust of authority, but you know I've still been vaccinated because it's the right. Thing but I, but I, you know, but I've but I believe what the corporations tell me about the vaccines yeah. without doing a mo- without a moment's question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just it. Yeah, clearly, they have the idea that they, there is that awareness that something's wrong, and you also see this in the amount of venom and viciousness with which people. Um, who, who aren't vaccinated are being attacked by the vaccinated. Mm. Um, I mean, seriously, if the vaccines worked and if coronavirus, the coronavirus was as deadly as the media claims, why don't they just sit back and let all the unvaccinated drop dead? Mm. Isn't that what's going to happen? They should just kind of wait, and as soon as the, the unvaccinated have all croaked, then they can go on with their lives. But they're not doing that. They're frantically trying to browbeat and bully everyone into getting vaccinated. That speaks to me of the, psycho- of the psychology of previous investment, the state where you've made a bad decision, mm. but you're trying to insist that it's not a bad decision, and the way you do that is by bullying other people into making the same decision. It's very common that, you know, we can all think of examples of that from the various stock market bubbles. We can think of examples of that from religious cults. And um, I'm, one of the best thing was the why the Concord stayed in, in production for so long, even though it could never make money. Mm. Um, it stayed in production because to admit that it was a flop, as of course it was, would have involved egg on everyone's face. So all the people who were involved in it kept on um, you know, coming up with reasons why, no, no, it's going to succeed. And vast amounts of, of, of pounds and euros went down that particular rat hole. Mm. Mm. Well, so I think so. So I think people may be aware. The vaccinated may be aware at some level that there's something going. There's something wrong here. Yes. There's something going on here that they may are aware of at some level, and that it does not fit the narrative. But they cannot let themselves face that. I mean, if it does turn out that the that these coronavirus vaccines, like all other vaccines, coronavirus-based diseases, cause serious health problems in the long run, the people who ran out and take the vaccine may have made the worst decision of their lives. And that's a horrible thing to live with. That's that slowly growing fear that maybe by trusting the corporations, you've, you've left, you've let yourself in for a world of hurt. Mm. So I think maybe that's what's going on. Yes. Yes. Well, it's a sobering thought and something that, you know, myself as a, a, very, very much unvaccinated person. Has... <laughs> a non-GMO human. Gotcha. Yes, yeah. Yeah, is it... yeah, I, I've, yeah I've, I've refused. My, my wife and I looked at the data, looked at the, you know, all the information of the coronavirus, looked at the eight weeks of inadequate testing, and said, yes. uh-uh. Yes. Then, of course, we had a chance to look at the, the reported side effects of these things, which are horrific. Yes. And to listen to people who were willing to talk about it saying, yeah, so I know, you know, these people who got vaccinated and dropped dead of heart attacks two weeks later, you know, young guy in his 20s, in his 20s, and he's so called dead of a heart attack. No, the only risk factor was a needle in his arm. Mm-hmm. And so our immediate reaction was, uh-uh, mm-hmm. I know how this movie ends. Mm, yes. It's very, very, uh, it's a very, it's a very sobering, time it's you know and to 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 know that you know so many of my friends and people i know and and Mm -hmm. and and some of my relatives as well thankfully my parents have switched on about this and they've gone "Uh -uh," as well as as so that but you know i I know a number of very very dear friends of mine some some other members of my family uh Mm -hmm. and 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 people around are just uh have Mm -hmm. 
gone for this and sometimes mm-hmm. through co- coercion sometimes just through coercion from their family sometimes just that, so that they could go abroad or all kinds of different reasons that they might have some of them felt vulnerable to covid and felt that they would be safer and it just mm-hmm. it just breaks my heart and i pray i pray for their health and safety I, I really do. i'm glad to hear that that's, yeah. that's probably that's a good thing to do yeah yeah um, but it's all we can do sometimes yeah it's all it's all it's all it's all we can do at this point and yeah the thing is i know the feeling i have i, I have a number of friends who i if you know if this turns out to be as bad as it might turn out to be they probably won't be around for much longer mm. and you know we'll see we'll see what happens um, my wife and I both had COVID-19. Right. Um, we got the illness. Um, we got over it quite readily. We used um, we used alternative health care. I won't go into the details, but um, but yeah, and we were fine. And so that was, of course, the other thing. One of the other things that fed into our experience. Been there, done that. It's not a threat. Yes. <laughs> and you know, I can deal with this. I, I can I can deal with a bad cold any time. And that's basically what it was like. Mm. This is something that I have heard from from people who have had COVID. I, I don't, mm-hmm. from, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't. I've been ill recently, but I, mm-hmm. none of the symptoms really match up with the classic, yeah. you know, losing your sense of taste and smell, that sort of thing. Yeah, we yeah we had the we had a we had a mild classic case. Neither of us had any serious breathing trouble, but um, yeah, you know. Um, so we're we're quite confident that if we went in and got the, got the blood test, we'd have a, we'd have the antibodies. Mm. But you know. I'm not greatly concerned. With uh, with this situation, what it seems to me that we're seeing, and you've touched on this as well in your blog, is mm-hmm. uh, the elites seem to be in a kind of death spiral now, mm-hmm. where they're doing. It's, they seem like they're doing as much as they possibly can to accelerate their certain downfall. Um, to the point of, like, for example, I mean, this is so so clear. I mean, America is at the moment the, the forefront of this process, and like uh-huh. with a, a a guy who clearly has basically uh, h- any cognition has basically left his body a long time ago in in the the the, the Oval Office, and now they're threatening to um, to fire. Um, Fire the, the those Navy SEALs who are refusing this untested, dangerous vaccine. Um, and these, you know, this is the Navy SEALs. Some are probably some of the most effective and well-trained, lethal fighters in the world. And, mm-hmm. and they're saying, well, if you don't take this thing that might seriously impair your health or kill you, then we're going to chuck you out of the military. And you've, mm-hmm. you've got now you've got potentially war bands. Yeah, and and to do it along with tens of thousands of other military personnel, yes, from every branch of the service, it's and in the meantime, you're also getting rid of half your health care workers. You're getting rid of all kinds of essential workers at a time when we have a massive labor shortage over here because, uh, well, basically because the employers are not willing to pay a living wage and. During the shutdown, an enormous number of people figured out there are other ways to get by. And so all of a sudden, every every store in my neighborhood has help wanted signs up. They can't get anybody because nobody wants to take the, the miserable wages and wretched working conditions and long, irregular hours and all the other crap that goes with being an employee in today's America. And so here's <clears throat> President Brandon, shall we say, um, <laughs> you know. Here, here's let's go, Brandon, insisting, <laughs> and we're going to make sure that even more people are driven out of work. Um, in what universe does this make sense? It's a very, very, very bizarre situation. Uh, mm-hmm. Is this is this a uh, uh, indicative, or is this is this? Would you say something that? Generally happens at civilizations at their at oh, yeah. their their decline. Is it the, the elites just actually do everything that they possibly can to <laughs> accelerate oh. the process? <laughs> yeah, no, it, this uh, actually not been on the on the level of civilizations. It's normal when a nation ha- is in its is in its terminal spiral before it either breaks up or there it's the government's overthrown. 
typically what, what, what drives that is that the elite class becomes totally disconnected from the realities on the ground. They live in their own little bubble. They're convinced that they know the truth, and if you try to tell them otherwise, you're wrong. And so they go bumbling along their merry way, doing things that, that, that they think are the right things. But since their policies are usually the major causes of problems in society, the further they push their policies, the more destructive the results become until things come, come crashing to a halt. Um, look into the French government during, the, say, 10 years or so before the French Revolution, before 1789. Mm. It's a great image of the same thing. The Russian government in the run-up to 1917, same thing. You have, a deta you have an elite class that's totally detached from reality, that is living in its own little dream world, whether it's Marie Antoinette at the Trianon, you know, where with her courtiers pretending to be shepherds and shepherdesses and, you know, to, you know, the fact that France is falling apart outside their doors. We don't want to know about that. Um, or, you know, Tsar Nicholas, um, you know, listening to, listening to Rasputin, listening to his little cabinet of cronies, and, and convinced that because he is the Tsar, he can do no wrong. Um, it's just, it's a very standard thing. Um, there's, there's just, it's, it's, this is, this is the situation we have in today's America. Um, where we our, our elite class, you know, they're they're in the bubble. It's that's even a, you use that term in American common speech nowadays. Everyone knows what you're talking about. They live in their own little world, where the fact that most that a growing number of Americans can't make ends meet working full time is irrelevant. But um, using the right pronouns is a life or death issue. Now. You know, I, I'm fine with people choosing their own pronouns. I, I have no problem with that. But if that's the th in today's America, in a nation in severe economic, political, and social crisis, if the thing that you are most upset about is that somebody might accidentally use the wrong pronoun, I think you need to check your priorities, and I think you need to get out more. Mm -hmm. Checking one's priorities as opposed to checking one's privilege, perhaps. Or perhaps <laughs> in checking one's privilege as well. The hilarious thing is the people who say check your privilege are the privileged ones. Yes. <laughs> you know, they're exercising their privilege. Um, yeah, no, check your priorities and get out more. Mm. Get outside of the bubble, actually find out what's going on outside of this little fantasy island of, of elite privilege and elite concerns. But they won't do that any more than, than Tsar Nicholas did, or, or, you know, Louis the Sixteenth, or, or for that matter, you know, um, oh, the, really, 1917, is a, or the, the, the run-up to the First World War is a great example, because you have, you have uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, who's to so totally caught up in this, this dream of global conquest, that he couldn't put two and two together and figure out that um, he was going to lose. And you have the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was bumbling along under the under the, under Franz, uh, what, Franz Joseph's rulership, and he was basically senile. Um, and everyone just kind of going, oh, we'll just continue doing these same stupid things, and nothing can go wrong. And you saw what happened. <laughs> hmm. Mm. Really, though, I think the best example right now is the is the latter part of the Soviet Union. Mm. Um, Dmitry Orlov, who was one of my fellow Peak Oil bloggers back yes. in the day, yes. um, did a lovely book called a lovely essay originally called "Closing the Collapse Gap," pointing out that um, the United States is utterly vulnerable to the same kind of sudden political collapse that overwhelmed the Soviet Union. It's it's a real possibility. It's becoming more possible by the day. And yet, we are not in as good condition to weather that as the Russians were when the Soviet Union came came apart. Um, I mean, and, and the thing is that, that he was saying this, what, um, better than 10 years ago. And now here we are, it's 2021, we've got Konstantin Chernenko, excuse me, Joe Biden, in, in, in our Kremlin slash White House, um, doddering along trying to pretend that everything's fine and we can just go through the motions. We have our Supreme Soviet, a.k.a. Congress, um, doing exactly the same thing. And the country's going to bits. <laughs> and, and so the, I don't think, 
I, I think people are not prepared. Certainly people outside of the United States are not prepared for the possibility that they may wake up that one morning and find out that the United States has suddenly fallen apart. Mm. That either it has a new government or it doesn't have a government anymore and various you know, groups of states are forming their own nations or something. Um, the U.S. is much more fragile, much more vulnerable, much less strong than it has been in the past, than it pretends to be now. We saw the debacle in Afghanistan. That didn't happen because somebody was stupid. That didn't happen. Be that happened because we didn't have the capacity to prevent it anymore. Mm. And you know, there are true. We still have troops in some other countries. They'll be coming home in the near future. I, I don't know exactly when, but European nations that rely on the United States for defense had better make other arrangements in a hurry, um, because the United States may not be there. And even if it is the its capacity to exercise power more than about two miles outside of its own boundaries may be very very low for all. Yes, yes. I mean the the mood in the United States uh, mm -hmm. appears from the outside as being uh, closer to civil war than any time that I've known in my short mm -hmm. sort of three decades, mm -hmm. three and a half decades or so of being alive. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, one of the little kind of uh, bits of cultural, contemporary cultural phenomena that I um, I keep a, 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 a an interest in at the moment is is the um, the kind of genre that's called maga rap, which is basically uh, a kind of gangster rap aesthetics with a sort of militant right wing maga supporting Trump supporting uh, mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. And you there's know a lot of it these days. Yeah. Yes, and and, and there, there's a lot of that, and it's you know there was one particular guy, Bryson Gray. Um, who's mm -hmm. got some rather amusing tunes, but he uh, he had a, a hit recently with um, with a, a track entitled "Let's Go Brandon." Obviously, um, <laughs> oh yeah, I was I was wondering if he was the guy who didn't "Let's Go Brandon," which was, instantly yeah. became number one on iTunes. Yes. And yeah, exactly. Now there are dancing videos all over the internet with people <laughs> dancing to "Let's Go Brandon." <laughs> Brilliant, but it, it, it's <laughs> it's. Um, you know, th there's something there's something deeply um, militant in the air, and, and oh, yeah. you know, and for those those I, I speak to sometimes about this over here in Britain, say, well, maybe, but you know, that's happening over there, and it's not going to affect <laughs> us. I'm like, it's going to affect us here. Like we're mm -hmm. we're we're culturally, economically, and socially very very much tied to uh, to the fate of North America and mm -hmm. you know our military is in Britain is a joke now uh, we rely the, so much as the, you say. This, and the scary thing is that you've got one of the two most powerful mili uh, militaries in Europe proper I can say you and the French are about it. Yes and and it, <laughs> it's we're, we're, we're stretched thin like you know I've, oh, yeah. I've spoken to people on the inside in the in the British military system and they say we're very vulnerable to invasion at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That so. doesn't... No, the, th the thing is, at this point, any decently sized African nation could invade a European country and win. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's that simple. Mm. Um, it, Germany, I mean, I mean, the, the Bundeswehr is, a, is, is even more of a joke. They, they had to, I think... Have they gotten their submarines working yet? I have no idea. They had all. They literally had all of their submarines stuck in the docks because there was some kind of problem with the rudders. Um, most of their most of their warplanes won't fly. Most of their tanks are are you know in the shop for lacking spare parts. Um, it's a complete joke. Mm. You know when when you realize that Poland could in 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 September of 2039 Poland could invade Germany and conquer it. Hmm. <laughs> and. I, I, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually working on a blog post right now which is going to talk about the next European war because, of course, there will be one. Mm. And um, I don't think anyone's ready for it. Yes. But, um, but, yeah, the United States is probably not going to be there to bail Europe out again. We did it in 1917. We did it in 1942. That was a long time ago, and we are falling apart over here. The one thing, the one thing that gives me a certain kind of, of wry hope with regard to avoiding civil war is that a lot of people on the right these days, a lot of the MAGA brigade, are also anti-vax, and 
they're willing to sit back and wait and see how many people die from the vaccine. Hmm. Because if the worst case scenario happens and a large percentage of the vaccinated people drop dead, that's predominantly people in the democratic end of the demographic. And mm. so they don't have to fight a civil war. They just have to wait for the enemy to fall over. Mm. Bleak, grim, Pretty yes, grim. but yeah. it's kept the bullets from flying. It's kept us from going kinetic. I'll take that. Yes. So what do you think will be you know, um, without, you know, obviously specific predictions are, um, uh, are mm-hmm. always, always tricky. Um, but, you know, what, what do you think is the outlook for the next few decades in North America and for uh, those of us in, in Europe? Mm-hmm. Um, well, a lot depends very much on how things how things play politically in America. In the United States, it is it's very much touch and go. It depends on whether, um, you know, what happens in the in the upcoming elections what happens in terms of the the current elite, whether it can cling to power, whether it loses power um, by electoral or other means. I think it's possible for the United States to stabilize, to kind of drop a chunk and become a regional power instead of a global hyperpower. And at Pullout, we still, you know, we still do produce enormous amounts of food. We're in, we're, you know, we, we have stuff for export. We'll have to we'll have default on our debts, but that's going to happen anyway. And I think the United States could go through a crisis and stabilize, or it could go to pieces. It could break apart into half a dozen countries very, very easily. And if that happens, of course, all bets are off, and Europe's going to be twisting in the wind. Um, Europe, I, the EU, I think, is going to... Well, um, William Butler Yeats in his book, A Vision, talked about you know, how Europe eventually would be forced into an artificial unity um, that, you know, and only, only dead, or dead and drying sticks can be tied into a bundle. I don't think anybody's really realized that Europe, may, Europe as we know, a historic Europe, is not durable. It's, it, it reminds me very much of the Austro-Hungarian Empire before the, right before the First World War. You've got this, this ramshackle collection of, of states um, bound together by governmental institutions that really don't work, and sort of lurching through one crisis after another, never quite resolving it, never quite blowing up. And then somebody does something stupid, and the whole thing goes up like a crepe suzette. And my concern is that that's what's going to happen to Europe, that um, one way or another, whether it's by war, whether it's by some other thing, the whole, the whole thing's going to come crashing down, and there's going to be a great deal of chaos and a great deal of mass migration from the Middle East and Africa, and the histor- many of the historic nations of Europe will cease to exist. I know this, this sounds extreme, but this is the kind of thing that happens in history. We've been through, and um, Europe has these intervals of of of, st- of stasis um, between the between the Napoleonic War and the wars and the First World War. It's a great example. There's a little back and forth around borders. There's a fight here. There's a fight there, but it just moves very slowly, and then boom, and the whole world changes. I think we're moving toward kind of that kind of situation in Europe. I hope that Britain has the common sense to stay out of it. Hmm. To, to just woe back and um, keep its keep it borders tight and not get involved in the in the crisis in Europe and you know work on its work on its relationships to the Commonwealth nations and to the United States and just kind of hang tough because if you get drawn into it there's not there's no good way out hmm. You mentioned uh, the possibility of Poland invading Germany in 2039. Um, now, just as a sort of, you know, as a hypothetical scenario, but mm-hmm. this is actually one one scenario that strikes me uh, that mm-hmm. you do, if you look at the history of Europe, there is very mm-hmm. frequently a push out of, like, all the way deep into the central steplands of Central Asia, mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. pushing outwards all the way through, you know, the 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 um, um, uh, the, the Russian areas and Eastern Europe, and then through through Germany and into Western Europe. I'm mm-hmm. wondering that you know you mentioned sort of Africa and the Middle East. Do you think there's a possibility also of a kind of a, a Russian 
invasion of Europe, say, for example, or even a, a neo, you know, an energized Mongolian invasion of Europe, maybe. <laughs> Um, maybe eventually, but at the moment, the demographics are against it. Mm -hmm. um, Russia and most of the most of the countries of the for, former Soviet Union are losing population at a dramatic rate. They're depopulating very quickly. It's very difficult to get an invading horde if you don't have a lot of people. And generally speaking, when the, when population is decreasing, the likelihood of you know invading other countries goes down. This is why the Middle East and Africa, because Africa is the only place in the world where population is still growing right now. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the population boom has turned in most of the world into a population bust. And, you know, Africa's, Africa's peaking, but it's still got a lot of people in it. The Middle East has peaked, but it still has a lot of people in it, and there's problems with water supplies. And so I, just, I, don't, I don't see an invasion from the East. I see Russia, frankly, much more concerned with controlling its southern border and trying to keep, um, you know, a surge from, um, from the Middle East and so on, from sweeping up into into the lower Volga um, watershed and so on. Um, <clears throat> but no, I would, I would look south across the Mediterranean. And given that a very large number of people from that part of the world have already settled throughout Europe, um, you could say that it's actually already well underway. Mm. Well, this and is, now yeah. the thing is, that one of the things people, when I mentioned you, you know, this, this happened the same way back when the invaders all had pale skin. Mm. You know, the reason you and I are speaking English and not Welsh is that a lot of illegal immigrants with weapons came across the North Sea. <laughs> and um, these things happen it's normal. It's perfectly understandable that people from Africa and the Middle East would look forward to their lives by moving to other areas. I, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, um, except that the nations that they're trying to get into might object to that and might choose to do something about it. It's, you know, it's one of those things. And so um, it has nothing to do with the skin color of the people involved. It's purely a matter of what's going to happen to political institutions, what's going to happen to economies, what's going to happen to um, public safety as nations, as, as nations dissolve into warfare conditions and, you know, things get ugly. Mm. And also, crucially, given the fact that the Euro such militaries as the Europeans have depend on lots of fossil fuels, lots of high tech, Check your newspaper about how the supply of those is mm. doing right now. Mm. Mm. Yes, you know it's not going to it's not going to do Britain a lot of good to have all these marvelous warships um, that require um, many many gallons of diesel of bunker oil. Yeah, when you can't get the bunker oil. Yeah, it's not going to do anyone any good to have all these high tech airplanes when you can't get the computer chips to keep them in the air. And so if it actually has to come down to old-fashioned warfare between ground forces, um, Europe is <clears throat> up a certain crick without a paddle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, this, this is a, a, a conversation that I've, another conversation that I've had with, mm -hmm. with my friends, who, you know, and, and, and I've raised up gently the possibility that, you know, uh, what we're seeing with and it's a very touchy subject and i understand because it, you know people are very very wedded to uh, the first of all the idea that we're good people and good people support open borders that's one thing uh, and you know also a, a very understandable and legitimate humanitarian concern for people who are fleeing dreadful situations abroad and i totally get that and i understand it and i i, I sympathize and, you know, when I talk about these things, I have to be very careful because people start mm -hmm. to instantly start to writhe and react and sort of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, act like I'm about to go into some sort of, um, we have a journalist here in the UK called Katie Hopkins, who's, you know, famous. I'm familiar with You're Katie familiar, Hopkins, familiar yes. with you her, want, yeah. You don't yeah. want to go kill Katie Hopkins. Yes, yeah. and, 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 you know, she said some really, just, just, just really nasty, unnecessary things uh, mm -hmm. regarding this stuff. But, but. The thing is, it's just, you know, looking at history, and this has been something I've always liked to do, and mm -hmm. your work in particular has 
has really clarified this. You look at history and you look at the end of the Roman Empire and exactly mm-hmm. as you say, what, what what's happening? Well, people are moving around. The empire is falling around. It's inviting people in, like the Goths, like the Franks, who mm-hmm. are invited in, many of them, for mm-hmm. um, to, to secure the, the outer borders of the empire. And then you've got mm-hmm. the Huns and you've got, you know, you, you've got all kinds of, of, of different tribes moving around. And at the end of em- empires, tribes move around and people get mixed up and wars happen and it's messy and it's ugly and it's never really, there isn't exactly a case of it's good guys versus bad guys. And in fact, sometimes the natives side with the incomers, you know, there's, um, mm-hmm. for example, there was a Seredic and Sinric, uh, or Kinric mm-hmm. rather, uh, who were yeah. two, 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 uh, two guys with Welsh names who ended up fighting basically fighting on the, on the, the side of the Saxons. On the side exactly. of the Saxons, yeah. So yeah. it's it's always messy and it's always complicated, but when people... I think the, 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 the issue that I've had is trying to get people to look at the immigration situation with a broader lens that is devoid of sentimentality. Yeah, to get... Basically to get them to stop po- doing moral posturing. Yes. This is not about... I am a good person, and therefore I have these ideas that the corporate establishment tells me are the good ideas. Um, it's, what is this actually going to do? And, by the way, are we doing anything good for these other countries in Africa and the Middle East by, you know, encouraging all of their potential activists to come here? Mm. Mm. Maybe if you know, maybe they should stay home and make change in their own co- in their own nation, <laughs> and you know, and it's just, or maybe we, you know, if if you feel very strongly that there these people people in in you know such and such part of the world are in this terrible situation, maybe you should try to do something about that and help them where they are. That works fairly well in the case of South Africa. Why aren't we doing it? Because of course the 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 hidden agenda behind this is driving down wages. Mm. That's why the corporate state wants all these immigrants because they can work. They can be made to work for substandard wages, especially illegal immigrants. They're undocumented. If they raise a fuss, you just, um, you know, in this country, you drop a dime to La Migra, and they're, you know, they're on their way to Mexico in a, in a matter of hours. That's the whole point behind the "we're the good people." Open borders are great. Open borders are great for corporate profits. Yes. And so that's why it's being. That's why it has been. Um, you know, pushed as hard, and, and of course, all the people who have who have stock portfolios, uh, they're saying open borders are great. It helps, you know, my my stock portfolio gain value, <laughs> and all of these crass economic motives cringing behind moral posturing. You know, I sometimes want, I sometimes wonder if I could get more detailed records from Roman times, if if it would turn out that the people who were talking about well, we should. Bring in the Visigoths. We should let them come in. If they were profiting off it somehow. (laughs) There must have been some form, there must have been some uh, uh, mercenary companies that were, you know, agitating for the, you know, the the, the comparatively lower wages that you could pay Frankish mercenaries. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and this is it. Um, one of the great problems we face now is that people like to do the moral posturing thing. They like to take complicated issues, turn them into simplistic comic book moral absolutes, and then run around prancing and you know, pretending to be the good guys while pursuing a set of policies that basically line their own pockets. And so and, you know, but getting people out of that, getting people to admit it's not as simple as that. It's a complicated world, and maybe you should think again, hard about what are the actual implications of this in terms of, you know, in, ter- in terms of the evidence of history. It's hard work. So I, I don't know if it's going to happen, actually. Mm. Yeah, it, it's it's a rather messy situation as it it's a very messy always situation, is. And yeah. it, it's not easy to, if you're, particularly if you, one is accustomed to simplistic thinking to, uh, to <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean I, I, to and, give you yeah. and you have simplistic thinking blared at you from the from the television tube night and day oh yeah. goodness me I mean to give you an example uh, I saw a girl recently uh, with a tote bag that said no borders no binaries <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, you know, <laughs> what I wanted to say to her, uh, so do you not use your computer then? Because uh, lots of binaries in that one. <laughs> That's funny. It's like, the thing is, you get this. Um, there was a book that was all the rage a while ago by a guy named Matthew Fox, who is a religious radical over here. The Coming of the Cosmic Christ was the title, and he was talking about this, it, it was just the most hilarious thing in the world. It was unintentional comedy. You know, there are two kinds of religions. There are dualistic religions and there are non-dualistic religions. And dualistic religions are absolutely bad and non-dualistic religions are absolutely good. And it never occurred to him that he was being more dualist in saying that than your average third century Gnostic. I mean, he filled pages with this long table of opposites in which one side was dualist and the other was non-dualist. Yeah, it's a lack of... Uh... It's just, you know, there is a certain, there is a certain basic element of thinking. I, I don't think it ever occurred to him that dualist was something other than a buzzword, that it actually meant something about the structure of thought. Yes. And that if he looked at himself in a mirror, he would see where all these evil dualists were close to him but yeah I, I was, thinking thinking is hard work most people don't like to do it it certainly is yeah i mean i i, I was uh I, I was involved in a group uh for a while in my in my lost mid-20s uh, around a, a <laughs> non-duality a popular non-duality teacher called muji um mm -hmm. and and um i remember being in the queue for one of his satsangs as we call them Mm -hmm. And um, um, uh, I heard these uh, these two women talking about how uh, they I think it was their their son or one of their children had some friends who were non duality people and some friends who weren't. I was like, okay. And late, later <laughs> later later that day, my dad, who was visiting the the the, the satsang with me, uh, said to me. Um, we we're looking for a place to, to get a bite to eat. And he said, if this cafe is filled with non-duality people, then I'm going to be feeling very dualistic. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> this is, but, the, yeah, but, you know, this is, a, this is a, you know, sort of indicative of, a, of, of where we're at. What do you think we can do right now to best prepare ourselves for the kind of changes that we're going to be living through in the next few decades. Okay, um, this is fortunately this is something that I've I've done a lot of writing on, a lot of thinking of. Um, one, probably the the core advice that I have it was was summed up usefully in the phrase "collapse now and avoid the rush." Mm. At this point. Since there, we're all going to be facing over the over the years and decades to come fairly steep declines in what counts as an ordinary standard of living these days. If you try to cling to that ordinary standard of living, you're going to fail and you're going to throw away a lot of resources you could put to other use. If right now, before crunch time hits, you decrease your expenditures, simplify your standard of living, learn how to do without you know, expensive goodies from overseas and things like that, basically reduce your cost of living to the point that you've got plenty of wiggle room. Um, that's, you're going to be getting, you're going to be getting there ahead of the rush. You're going to be able to, you really will figure out how to do things before you actually need to do them. Being poor, I've, I've been poor. I mean, most writers have, if you, unless, unless you're J.K. Rowling, you can count on spending a long time between when your first book is in print and when you actually make decent money. And so my, my wife and I, um, we, we lived very cheap for a while. And it takes, it takes work. It takes knowledge to, do, to live poor comfortably. It can be done, but you have to know how. And if you need to get practice. So I strongly recommend first people decrease your expenditures, put the extra money into doing things if you have, if you have your own place, insulate it. Um, do all kind of, you know, get the things and do the things and learn the things that will make it possible for you to get by comfortably on a lot less money in a situation where the store shelves will not always be full um, and where you cannot necessarily count on electricity 24-7 and all kinds of things like this. Um, so collapse now and avoid the rush. That's the basic, the basic set of rules I've been arguing for a while. And 
curiously enough, here in the United States, where the store shelves very often these days aren't full, and where, depending on where you are, you may not be able to count on electricity. I've heard from people who did that, and they're saying, you know, it worked. So that's point one. Point two, the mass media is not your friend. Hmm. If you have a television, please get rid of it. It is, you know, there's, I mean, it's filling your mind with garbage. Um, it, seriously, there's a reason why they call that stuff programming. Get rid mm. of your television. Um, get a good ad blocker on your um, on your computer if you if you don't have one already. Um, decrease your exposure to mass media and to the collective consciousness because it is going to tell you to do all the worst things. <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, right now that when you turn on the TV, whatever advice you get is the is the wrong thing to do. So just. Get rid of it. Clear your mind. Make some space for yourself. A little more privacy, a little more solitude, a little more time thinking and reflecting will do you a lot of good. Um, and of course, um, a lot of the people who listen to who are listening to us may already be doing this. And this great on the off chance that there are still people who are caught up in the social buzz and caught up in the media thing and caught up in this and that internet spectacular. Back away while you can. So. And the third thing to do, learn some history. And I don't mean stuff videos on the, from the Beeb or what have you. I mean actually like learn some history. Um, I don't know what your local library systems are like. All ours are hanging in there. Um, get some, you know, learn how people lived where you are now living 100, 200, 500 years ago. You may be living that way by the time you're old. Um, but learn something about how nations rise and fall. Um, read up on what it was like to live through the French Revolution, what it was like to live through the Russian Revolution. You may be experiencing the same thing. Having a head start on, on survival tactics will be a good idea. Um, get yourself used to the fact that stability is not something you can count on possibly ever again. And that, uh, you know, you may be under a different government sooner than you believe, by which I don't mean there's just a, a change of personnel in Whitehall. Um, you may be under a different political system sooner than you expect. Um, you may be facing radical changes in what you do with your time and what you do for a living and how, you, how your lifestyle operates, what kind of foods you can get. Um, this is the kind of thing that happens in the sort of rough and tumble world that we're moving into. Um, and really beyond that, just keep your eyes wide. Don't trust the government. Don't trust the corporations. Don't trust the media. Uh, make, make up your own mind for yourself. That's about as good advice as I can offer. Well, I think that's a good point to wrap things up. And uh, we, can, we can sum it up there. We can, we've got a, mm -hmm. a pretty, pretty rough ride over the next few decades. But I think if we take, take those bits of advice, uh, we will be in a much better mm -hmm. position to actually um, live a relatively decent life. Mm -hmm. So, with that said, thanks for talking to me, John. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I've enjoyed it. And for those who want to check out your work, where can we find it? Okay, the, my main blog is ecosophia, E-C-O-S-O-P-H-I-A dot net. Um, I post there every Wednesday. And then I also have my Dream With account, which is ecosophia.dreamwith.org. Um, you can get to you can get all my books from um, bookshop.org um, and or any of the other online places. But better still, go to your favorite local bookstore and, and, and ask them to order things. They'll be happy to do so. Um, that's about the rest, Ben. Fantastic. Thanks very much, John. You have a great day, and I hope to talk to you, you again too. soon. I look forward to it. Take care.